Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we'll be launching the uh, report, Taking the Pulse of the European Foundation Sector, Moving from Proving Impact to Improving Impact. Uh, my name is Lisa Heenberger and I'm a professor at ESADE and I'm also the director of the ESADE Center for Social Impact. Um, and we have been um, producing this report with the support of uh, BBK. Uh, I'll now be sharing my slides. So the agenda of the webinar uh, is as follows. We'll start with an introduction to the webinar. We'll also explain um, a little bit what we have done in terms of creating the uh, communities of practice on impact measurement and management. We have a European and a Spanish one. Um, we'll then go ahead and present the key insights from the first year of this study, uh, which is really the content of uh, the report. And then we'll uh, have a panel discussion with some of the participants of the community of, of practice. Uh, so I'll start by introducing our speakers today. Uh, we have Henrik Brinkman, who's a senior expert at impact orientation at Bertelsmann Stiftung in Germany. Uh, we have Leonora Buckland, who's a co-author of the report and a senior researcher at the ESADE Center for Social Impact. Um, we have Lee Alexander Risby, who's director of effective philanthropy at Laudus Foundation, and also Veronica Urda, who's head of socioeconomic impact at uh, BBK. Um, I'll also like to say a few words about the ESADA Center for Social Impact. Um, our objective is really to create, to understand so, uh, social problems and come up with solutions to address uh, some of the, the biggest uh, problems in the world. And we're doing this really through three different activities, teaching, research, and social debate. And the research that we do um, is with rigor, reach, and relevance, and it's about and for social impact. So what do we need, uh, mean when we talk about social impact? Well, it's really about um, achieving some sort of a change, so a positive or negative change. And this is experienced by people or the planet as a result of one or several activities. And the research areas um, that we address at this, the Asada Center for Social Impact are really three. It's impact investing, it's impact entrepreneurship, and it's also impact measurement and management, which is really the topic of the day. Um, so I'd like to also now talk a little bit about uh, the communities of practice that we have set up uh, on impact measurement and management. So what do we mean by that? I already explained what we mean by impact. Um, and impact measurement is really measuring these effects. And as you know, there are lots of different approaches and methods and frameworks um, to measure impact. So part of the objective of creating a community of practice has been to understand these tools and methods and share best practice. But we also wanted to understand how to integrate impact measurement into the systems, the culture, the capabilities of organizations. Um, and this is really where it becomes more difficult because it's about changing mindsets. It's about actually turning sort of just measurement into something that is actionable and that has the potential to really create um, some sort of a change. Um, so that's really what we have been trying to uh, research you know, in, in this um, community of practice together with uh, a wonderful group of foundations that I'll, I'll present in a minute. Um, so why did we set up a community of practice on impact measurement and management? Well, we conducted um, research uh, a couple of years ago that was uh, that was launched in 2020 and it was also supported by BBK and here we did uh, case studies of five um, uh, foundations that had very different approaches to impact measurement and management and we devised a sort of a learning journey um, that showed how 
European charitable foundations could actually start integrating impact measurement and management into the ways of, of working. And one of the outcomes of this study was really to um, to sort of um, request, you know, a request from the foundation sector saying that they needed to uh, collaborate more, they needed more transparency. And we decided that a good idea was to create a sort of a safe space where foundations could share best practices, but also explain, you know, what are some of the challenges, you know, what are some, some of the things that are not working and, you know, how could they help each other? Um, so that's why we decided to launch um, these communities of practice. And you'll see here a, a sort of a word cloud that was created in our first webinar. Um, and this was really when the foundations themselves were coming together and explaining, like, this is what we would like to do in, in the, or the, the sort of the, the, the principles that we would like to, to use, you know, in the communities of practice. So it's all about trust, collaboration, transparency, sharing, learning, and being open with each other. Um, we had uh, several objectives for the communities of practice. And it was really about understanding, um, as I mentioned, you know, what works and what doesn't work for foundations to learn from each other. So it was a kind of a peer uh, learning approach facilitated by us, um, where you know, the foundations themselves could improve um, their impact measurement um, and management. But we also, of course, wanted uh, these learnings not to just stay within uh, sort of those foundations that were participating, but we also wanted to share some of those learnings with the sector. Uh, and that's really what we're doing today, you know, through this webinar. So we'd like to uh, explain to the entire foundation sector, you know, some of these best practices and some of the learnings from the first year um, of the communities of practice. Um, I also wanted to explain a little bit who's part of the community practice. And um, we've had you know, the privilege to work with amazing organizations, so foundations uh, across Europe, uh, 26 foundations based in 13 different European countries, um, very, different, uh, very different types of foundations, some large, some small, um, some new, some old, um, you know, some corporate foundations, some legacy foundations, community foundations, and uh, in the beginning, this seemed to be a, a bit of a challenge. You know, how could we actually get them together and learn from each other? But I think it's also been very enriching, you know, for the, the community of practice to have this diversity. Um, and you can see as well here the, the logos of the foundations that have, have participated. So also, I would like to thank all of them, you know, for being, you know, very active members of the community. Um, and also... You could see here the, um, that there's a diversity in terms of the budget. So you have some um, smaller foundations with annual budgets less than uh, 10 million euros a year, but also some very large foundations with um, budgets of more than 50 million. Um, we also created a Spanish community of practice. So the, the first one is uh, the European one, which um, was spread across the European countries. But we also thought that it was very in uh, important to have a national one. Um, you know, some of the reasons were uh, that we thought that perhaps this kind of um, sense of trust could be, um, you know, more e easier to implement, you know, in, in a national context where, you know, people speak the same language, they probably know each other and a little bit more about their work. Um, so that these foundations, these 21 foundations have been part of, of the, the Spanish community practice. Um, and, you, and they're also quite diverse in terms of their work. And, and also, as you can see, in terms of the budget, um, you know, there, there's also diversity here. So um, that's really the introduction that I wanted to give you in terms of uh, why, you know, we decided to do this work and um, who are the foundations that have been part of it and, um, and they have been participating and enriching the conversations that we've had. We also had um, external experts uh, who attended our webinars because we had um, a meeting every month and so every other month with each community of practice, and for us, it was every month. Um, and uh, these experts were, for example, explaining, you know, some uh, new innovative tools, um, some approaches, um, and also sort of uh, things for the participants to think about. Um, and now it's my pleasure to hand over to my colleague, uh, Leonora Buckland, who will be presenting the key insights uh, from the first year. Thanks, Lisa. 
I'll just uh, share my screen there. Yeah. So, um, just uh, yeah, so um, I wanted to take everyone through uh, some of the highlights of, um, of this report that we're launching, which is really a summary of all of the amazing conversations and content um, that we have been discussing with all of the foundations that Lisa introduced over the last year. Um, and the, the report really uses uh, as the key kind of organizing framework, uh, the tool or um, the guide, a roadmap, which we call it, which we developed as part of the last original research that, that Lisa mentioned. Um, and why did we develop this? We certainly didn't want to create yet another framework. <laughs> or tool, but rather we wanted to maybe move the discussion and the dialogue, um, not simply focusing just on the tools and the more technocratic elements of impact management, but actually really getting to grips with the how, how do we do that and how does it live and breathe organizationally, particularly within the foundation sector. Um, and we've called this impact management learning journey roadmap because we recognize that um, for everyone on, on this is actually a journey, it takes time um, and it's a sort of evolutionary test and try approach. Um, so I'll just very briefly take you through the themes as they are the kind of organizing framework for us um, in this report and in a lot of what we do. So the first theme is, is perhaps one that there is more discussion and dialogue and focus on um, out there, which is the designing of, of the approach. So, you know, which tools and frameworks do you use? How do you actually, you know, uh, collect, validate data? Um, so it's the what, where, hen, uh, when and uh, of, of impact management. Um, and under the, each of the theme, we have a series of sub themes, um, which we investigated in the original research. Um, and then we move away from, from that sort of perhaps more technical um, side to actually looking at um, some, which we feel is slightly under-researched um, issues around, you know, how do we organize and how do we resource impact management? There isn't actually a lot of data out there about, you know, what, what foundations and even the social sector is spending um, on impact management and how they're doing it. Do they have central impact teams? Do they work through their program teams? How, how does this actually work organizationally? Um, and then the third theme touches on the cultural aspects that Lisa was mentioning. Um, in particular, how, how do we work with our board? How do we develop this sort of impact orientation and mindset? And, and how do we become the learning organizations that um, will most fruitfully use all of this um, impact data and analysis that we're, we're doing? Um, and then the fourth theme is all about capacity building, which is, you know, do we have the skills internally as a foundation to do all this? What do we need? Do we need to hire more data sciences? A scientist, do we need to um, really adopt more of a um, diversity, equity, and inclusion approach to to in, to get include the voices of those who whose lives we're touching, um, and that sort that that all comes in in there. And what's our relationship with the organisations we support? Um, and then the fifth one is is really at the heart of of this whole um, initiative, which is about collaboration, co collaborating, sharing knowledge, and, and being transparent. So that's the roadmap. Um, and in, in the report, which we will um, send to you on Monday, uh, along with the, the video of this webinar, um, for each of these themes, we describe the theme, we include a table which shows what, um, what you know, it might look like if you're a beginner, what it might look like if you're on the journey, and what it might look like if you're advanced. So in fact, it can be used as a kind of self diagnosis tool of where you as an organization are on impact management. Um, we also include, obviously, the insights from our discussions to date, some case studies to bring this all to life, and I'll introduce a few today. Um, then a section on, you know, what, what we're finding challenging, what the community of practice is struggling with, which I think very much will reflect and mirror what's, what's, what the whole um, sector, not just the foundation sector, but the whole measurement and evaluation sector is finding difficult. Um, and then ending on a bit of a more hopeful note about where this is all going and what maybe some pioneering and innovative approaches might be. Um, so just to start um, really touching on some of the key findings that we, we've, we've, we've had, 
um, what we wanted to do when we, we got the foundations together was to, to establish, you know, what we might call uh, a bit technical, but the baseline, you know, where were they in terms of the impact management um, learning journey? And so we asked them to, to fill in a, a kind of a diagnostic survey. Um, and you'll see the results of that on, on this chart, which is a spider chart. Um, and in the green, the green line um, shows the average response. So we aggregated um, and averaged all of the responses from the European community of practice. Um, the yellow uh, shows the average response of the Spanish community of practice and the red is, is the average of the Spanish and the European. Um, so what can we read into this? Uh, I think there, there are sort of two perhaps key, uh, key points here. The first is that there is a bit of a difference between the European community of practice and the Spanish community of practice in the sense that um, the European foundation group is, is slightly further more advanced or ahead of, um, in general, of, um, of, of the Spanish across all of the themes, but in particular, the organizing for IMM and the, and the building capacity theme. Um, and the other thing to note, I think, is that actually these figures are perhaps lower than you might imagine, because we asked foundations to rate from zero to 10 where they were on each of these themes. Um, and so the average is kind of, kind of about six, 6.5 for the European, which is which is quite low out of 10. And, and what we see is that, so we have a diversity of foundations. So some were rating themselves much more highly and others um, were less highly, obviously, to get to that average. But I think the key message is we're all we're all learning together. Um, and that we do recognize that there's, you know, there are some challenges, and there's a lot of room for improvement. So I think that kind of underlines why um, these type of initiatives can can actually be be helpful for the sector, recognizing that there's, um, that there's still a long way to go until we feel really good and comfortable about about what we're doing. So just touching on um, the highlights on a, on a theme by theme basis. Um, the first theme is the designing of an impact management approach. Um, so what we, 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 we did here really was to look at what are the different tools and frameworks that the foundations in our group are using. Um, we found that the theory of change is, is overwhelmingly that the tool that foundations come back to that they are using with 82% um, using that. But sustainable development goals are increasingly being adopted um, by foundations. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, one of the key challenges that foundations in our group talk about is, is, is which I think is, is recognized very widely, is, is how to walk that line between, you know, getting enough rigor um, and being secure enough about the evidence that you're collecting with being proportionate because, you know, a lot of these type of evaluations, impact evaluations, they're quite expensive. Um, and also, you know, how much demand do you want to put on the, the projects and programs you're working with, either your operating programs or those of other organizations you're funding. So that's always a balance foundations are kind of exploring. Um, and then there's all, all the issues about, um, you know, contributions. So given we can collect all the data um, about the impact of our of the projects and the programs we fund what is our contribution what is our uh, our role in in all of that impact um, one of the good things we're seeing and the positive notes is that there is a lot more um, impact evaluation um, and a lot more independence i think being prioritized there's a move to more um, external uh, people coming in to do impact and also crucially the sharing of that information more widely. So just to give a few examples and to say that in the report we have a lot more examples from all of the uh, brilliant uh, foundations in our group. So I'm just giving you a taster here um, and I specifically haven't put the examples of the panelists in because they will be talking about their own examples. So I'm trying to introduce a few different um, foundation examples. But uh, what you'll see here in front of you is the theory of change. Um, the, 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 it was for, from tw the 2020 report of Reach for Change, which is a foundation based, uh, it's a Swedish foundation, but it operates um, in nine different countries and it uh, supports social entrepreneurs who are um, changing the lives of children. So for those uh, more kind of technical impact specialists, you will 
um, you know, notice the traditional logic frame here. If you've got, you know, your activities, your outputs, your short term outcomes and your long term outcomes. Uh, I won't go into the details of reach for changes um, theory of change. They're actually in a process of um, of developing a, a new theory of change. But I think that the interesting thing is that they have spoken about how important the whole theory of change has been for their internal alignment um, and to create uh, that sense of everyone being on the same page, particularly uh, since they work across so many different countries and have uh, program managers you know, spread across the world. Um, and then we've talked quite a lot also, obviously, about the SDGs. And one of the things I think people have, um, foundation professionals have discussed is that it can be quite hard to make the macro SDGs uh, really operationalize those from an impact management perspective. Um, but we do have uh, new initiatives like the UNDP SDG impact standards, which we talk about, um, and which foundations such as Rethink Ireland are, are really operationalizing, which is uh, perhaps helping um, in that aspect. And here's an example from BMW Foundation, um, which is a German foundation supporting uh, responsible leadership worldwide um, that has used the SDGs really as, as a guiding framework, helping them to decide which topics to tackle. Um, and this uh, visual is from their impact investing report, which, uh, which, which really is an SDG mapping um, exercise, which a lot of the foundations have actually done to say, you know, which SD SDGs are they, um, are they, are they using, and, and what, what impact are they creating SDG by SDG? Um, so, so that's the sort of whole um, developing your kind of approach, and then. Moving on to resourcing and organizing for impact management, um, what we've seen, and I think this is quite interesting data because, as I said, I don't think there is a, a huge amount of data in the foundation sector. Um, what we've seen is that there is a massive diversity of, of how much um, foundations are spending on um, this whole area of impact management. Uh, so you see here at the bottom, there are 27% of foundations which are uh, spending under 1% of their annual grant making budget on, um, on IMM. So that's quite low. But then at the top end, you have foundations which are, which are spending up to 35% of their annual grant making budget on the, these areas of, of monitoring, evaluation and learning. So there's a big spread. Um, and I think one of the interesting things to notice, though, is that I think the general trend is 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 an upwards trend um, in terms of foundations over time investing more in this, not just in terms of money, but also uh, in terms of attention and and time. Uh, another issue that we really feel um, is a very interesting one, which we're hoping to explore a lot this year, is is that of governance. Um, which really touches on the whole heart of, you know, why are we doing this and to who are we accountable and how do we make sure that we are including all of our, our stakeholders, you know, adequately in the governance of impact management and how do we make sure it's authentic, it's honest, that there's independence. So that whole issue of, of governance um, is really interesting. And we, uh, we're, going to explore, we're going to explore that a lot more th this, this year. Um, and then just moving on to, um, to the third theme, I'm not touching on every single point because I'd, I'd really like to get to the panel and start more of a dialogue. Um, but I, I think this, this whole theme of organizational culture is very important. And we have seen how each foundation is really um, a kind of a, a beast of its own with its own history and um, different uh, vibe and DNA, as it were, um, and so with some, they have been born with this 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 great uh, impact DNA, and from the very get go, have been investing hugely on it. But with others, it's been a more uh, cultural change shift, and they're having to break down some silos um, and some resistance internally. Um, but I think we spend a lot of time talking in the community of practices about learning how important it is that we really focus on that, the learning side, rather than just the kind of KPIs, like key performance indicators or the accountability. So there's there's a lot um, in, in, in the report and in general that we're, we're discussing about, about that. And uh, we've got one example here from Argidius, which is a foundation that's a, 
um, provide support to business um, support organizations across the globe, which are working with SMEs to, um, to help lift um, communities out of, out of poverty and provide employment. Um, and they're kind of an interesting case study of how they um, how they approach learning, particularly with their with their partner organisations. Um, so they have tried to really reduce the amount of um, indicators that they're using to to manage their impact. They actually only have three um, indicators that they collect and systematically over time from their organisations. Obviously, they're quite focused in what they do, so that's that's more possible for for an organisation like them. Um, they have very close relationships with their uh, their partners, but they also move beyond just asking their their partners or, or grantees for impact data, and they really go out and do a lot of impact evaluations or commission them, um, and also support with external research. So, um, you know, that whole sort of learning loop does require investment and time. Um, which I, I think is uh, is really important. And in fact, it is, you know, the quote here on the right, which is learning is a team sport. It doesn't just happen because it's in someone's job title. And I think that's really important that the whole foundation needs to be, um, needs to be involved in that. So in terms of the, the capacity building element, um, this, is a, this is a huge priority for pretty much all of the foundations in our um, in our community of practices, they're very interested in you know what's the best way to work with um, their partners, their grantees, their investees around impact measurement and management, because a key challenge that um, that there is is that you know sometimes, uh, well, often um, the organisations they support don't have uh, the time, the energy, the resources, and the knowledge to really. Um, perhaps do the kind of um, impact management which could be uh, fantastic in terms of generating the learnings we've been talking about. So um, there's a lot of discussion about how to kind of work there and also this whole element of the power dynamics between the funder and the funded and how to break down some of those barriers. Um, and then we've got the final theme, which is um, around collaborating, sharing knowledge and being transparent. So I think um, what we've seen, and there's there's a lot more in the report, a lot more examples and, and rich content on this, but um, obviously the fact that the foundations are investing a lot of time and co-creating this community of practice is, is a signal, a strong signal that, you know, that there is an appetite for this kind of collaboration. Um, and we've talked a lot about, you know, transparency, which has always been a bit of a hot topic, I think, for the foundation sector, which is sometimes seen as, as quite opaque. Um, and uh, I mean, other other things that have emerged is that, uh, you know, that there is this move towards um, more data science. And, and actually, the European Foundation Centre has, has now a group for foundations working on um, data science and open data. Um, and, and so that, that, that there is this desire to kind of um, learn together as foundations to collaborate. But I think there's still challenges um, which foundations have been very honest about in terms of getting the most out of the collaborations that they're engaged in. Um, so that is um, that is really the, um, the, the, the learning so far and um, there's obviously a lot more detail and case studies that's going to be in the report so we'd encourage you to look at that um, and we're also going to be releasing um, quite a few different types of communications uh, including you know articles hopefully some podcasts and things to sort of build on uh, build on this and we're really keen for all of this amazing um, content and discussions and the privileging of um, the privileged information we've had um, access to to kind of get out more widely. So um, just to introduce uh, our panel, our esteemed panel, uh, very um, excited to have a few of the representatives of uh, the European Community of Practice with us, um, and also um, obviously the Spanish Community of Practice, represented uh, by Veronica Urda, um, who is uh, who's from uh, head of socio-economic impact at, at BBK. Um, started her career at Deloitte Consulting, um, so she's been focusing on measuring economic and social impact of nonprofit organisations. Um, and public institutions at both a European and a national level. Um, and since uh, for the last two years, she's been head of, of the social impact department at the BBK Foundation um, and has been a key uh, partner with us in developing this whole uh, community of practice. And we're very grateful for, for her support. 
Um, and then we've got um, Henrik Brinkman, who is a senior expert in pact orientation with Bertelsmann Stiftung, uh, which is a German foundation. Um, and he has had a long recorrido or um, experience, as we'd, we'd say, in, um, since 2001, he's been responsible for managing various projects um, uh, in, in the field of, at, at Bertelsmann Stiftung, in the field of economic policy, health policy, social insurance. Um, he has a PhD in health economics, um, so uh, we're very uh, happy to have him on board. Um, and then finally, Lee Risby, who um, leads and oversees the, all the performance management, evaluation and organization learning at Lauders Foundation. Um, he's also ha got a long recorrido in this whole space with uh, 20 years of experience in, in the evaluation. Um, for various different organizations. And he was um, originally at the CNA Foundation before uh, before Lauder's Foundation. Um, he's also uh, be recently been made a board member of the Center for Effective Philanthropy in the US. So he has a very interesting perspective, I'm sure, of um, the, the, you know, uh, what, what effective philanthropy is and how that relates to impact management um, and what's going on in, um, in the States. So I'm going to stop sharing now um, and move, uh, sharing my screen and move into uh, the, the panel. So um, can we start, uh, Veronica, with you just telling us a little bit um, about BBK and um, why you have been so interested in sponsoring and getting involved um, in this and what impact management, what's the purpose of impact management for, for, for you at BBK? I think you're on mute, Veronica. You're on mute. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Thank you, Lenora. It's a pleasure to, to be here to do, to, with you today. Uh, well, uh, uh, for more than a century, uh, BBK Foundation has worked uh, to advance inclusion, culture and sustainable economic development in Vizcaya, a, a region in the north of Spain, the Basque country. We develop social and cultural projects aimed at improving well-being in our community. And as you mentioned, we are all convinced of the need of, to measure and manage impact uh, if we want to maximize it. So uh, in 2015, our foundation starts developing, uh, developing a methodology uh, to evaluate the results of the projects that we, we, we take. This methodology is very aligned with our strategic goals and it provides us a solid basis for decision making. And during this journey, uh, we, we face a lot of challenge and we've been learning a lot. And in 2000 and 2018, we promote, uh, in collaboration with you, with the SADE, the research about the learning journey of other European foundations on impact management, which was uh, the seed of the communities of practice that we created a year ago. And we are really happy to have created this collaborative space where all the participants can share this, their experience and one learns from the others and we continue moving forward hand in hand and facing the challenge that impact management measurement hold for us. Uh, Henrik now and I think maybe one thing that's interesting about Bertelsmann Foundation you could probably introduce a little bit about it um, is that you're an operating foundation actually rather than a grant making foundation so you know how does how does that affect your um, your impact management? Yeah hello everyone and, and thank you for uh, having me. Uh, the keyword I'd, I'd probably use to to describe our approach is um, decentralized um, meaning that the responsibility for impact management lies with the individual projects and programs. Um, and we treat it as an integral part of project management, of professional project management. Um, and there is central support and counseling available. Uh, there is also an emphasis on, on capacity building um, internally. Uh, for the projects and programs. Um, and that allows for tailor-made um, approaches um, for the individual projects and also for a high flexibility, which we find useful. Um, you could probably say that the guiding principle is uh, we aiming to be a learning organization. 
Um, and the reason for that um, is twofold. You've mentioned, Leonora, we are um, an operating foundation. Um, and we also have a very diverse project portfolio. And that is literally ranging from musical education in elementary schools uh, to transatlantic security policy and anything in between. Um, so a one-size-fits-all approach uh, for us simply uh, didn't make sense, um, neither for project management nor for the governance uh, of the whole organization. So uh, we realized early on that a nonprofit, well, quite frankly, isn't a for-profit, and uh, you need to have a success to have a successful IM governance in a foundation, you need to build on the common values um, and the right amount of trust um, and project autonomy. So with that in mind, I think the difference between a grant making uh, and an operating uh, foundation is, is probably smaller than we often assume. Um, what we do internally, um, grant making foundations uh, have to do externally, and that is picking um, and supporting uh, crews who are, are able to, to navigate uh, the project ships, uh, also through complex and, and sometimes changing waters. Um, and when grant making foundations talk about embarking uh, on a learning journey, uh, I think that is precisely uh, what they mean and, and what we try to do internally with our diverse project portfolio. Thanks a lot, Henrik. And there were some kind of key words you used there. I, I'm talking about complexity and I'm going to bring Lee in because I think you guys uh, at Loudest Foundation, obviously you can introduce us a little bit to, to it, but um, are dealing with, with a lot of complexity and tackling some really big issues like you know climate change and inequalities. So you know how does that work in terms of developing your your impact framework and well, your impact management and learning. I think you're on mute, Lee. There we go, I'm off mute now. Um, yeah, well, just a little bit, kind of 10 second introduction to Loudus, if, that, if that's possible. Yes. Uh, we're, we're addressing the climate crisis and the inequality crisis. One might say the two major um, crises of our age and um, we're doing that working through industry um, actually the three industrial uh, sectors where um, our founding family the Brennickmeyer family have their businesses so in fashion finance uh, and the built environment so construction and you know when you when you you know when you want to in essence move those three industries towards uh, more sustainable trajectories uh, going towards things like net zero by 2050, even though we need to get there sooner than that, of course. Um, it's quite daunting. So, you know, for us, before we started thinking about, okay, well, how are we going to measure impact and understand our impact? You first of all need to understand the systems that you want to change. So, you know, the first step for us developing our um, impact management and measurement was to map the system. Uh, which we did quite exhaustively in, in early 20, early and mid 2020. And we did that not just by kind of locking ourselves away in a room and, and uh, mapping the system. We talked to our partners uh, and other experts in the field. We talked to about 300, uh, 300 uh, stakeholders in total. Um, and that gave us an idea of, okay, well, what, are, what are the key issues? What are the key challenges? Um, and then out of that, you know, when, you, when we developed our strategy and our theory of change, which is intimately related to that, we were able to uh, think about, okay, how, how do we want to intervene in the system? And what are the broad systemic um, outcomes that we need, uh, or we, we need in five or 10 years? And not just outcomes for Laudus, um, but outcomes for the system and for others. So very much taking, uh, not so much trying to attribute things to us, but trying to um, see how we and others will contribute to change in the system. So just a little brief example for you here. You know, one of the things that we know needs to happen both on inequality and climate change is that 
policymakers need to reform, implement, enforce, and protect critical laws and policies that require climate positive practices, equity, and inclusion. That's just one example of one of our broad um, uh, results or outcomes that we need to get to uh, quite quickly. And what do we need? To, what do we need to do to get there? Um, again, you know, policy change is easy to say but difficult to do. So how do you want to do that? We unpack that by saying, okay, well, we want to influence policymakers and regulator, regulators. We want to make sure that policy processes uh, are more inclusive, uh, that involve mechanisms for participation and diverse voices for decision making. This is in our theory of change, of course. And you know that has to um, uh, bring about changes like rules and regulations, or rules with teeth, uh, as we call it. And then the third step that we went into, uh, kind of the final step, you know, in terms of um, getting down to business on measurement, is that um, from the TOC, we can develop quite um, appropriate, um, I would say, precisely broad criteria, or what we call rubrics, to help us measure ours and our partners' contribution to change. So very much focused, again, on, on you know, contributing, because we're in a difficult and complex system, Attribution doesn't really um, uh, help so much uh, when you're trying to act systemically. And I wouldn't really say that we're managing for impact. What we're doing is we're trying to manage and understand a shared trajectory towards change. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop there. Great. I'm not sure how we can get a, a, a catchy acronym for that. I am <laughs> let's, sure. not, let's, not, let's not have an acronym. <laughs> But uh, yes, I, I I understand, and and just to say, actually, maybe if someone from our team could post the loudest foundation theory of change in a evaluative rubric link, um, it could be really nice for for the audience to go and have a look at, because that was a very uh, amazing job and a thorough job done there to to map, as as Lisa said, to map out the theory of change in the system. So, um, uh, that, I think that could be useful. Um, so yeah, just 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 to go back, um, Veronica. To I mean, we we talk about this sort of the systems change and how many other actors you're obviously um, working with to to develop that uh, th those changes. Um, and I know you've uh, you've thought quite a lot about you know in Biscaya all of the nonprofit organisations you fund and support, how you can um, you can help them because it's really you know they're the ones that are on the ground and also measuring their own their own impact and of course you're also an operating foundation so like Bertelsmann you have um you have things like nurseries so how, how do you help all those those people that are working in these systems to feel a bit more confident and comfortable I mean we're all from the evaluation world and we have that background but most of the people on the ground don't so you know how do we how do we help them yes that's a good point that's a good point Leonora well uh I think that involving our partners and all the entities we collaborate or organizations we collaborate with, uh, it's it's something um, very very important and it's a key success factor for for a for, for your IMM model design. I think in our case we work with more than 200 organizations uh, that have very different capacities and management models. For some of them, it's, it's very easy to provide us with the information we ask or we require. Uh, because they have strong information systems or, or reporting processes. But for some others, it's a, it's a huge challenge uh, because they are still in a previous phase in, in terms of management uh, or they, they don't have so many resources or people uh, working inside. And for them, it's, it's, it's more tough to, to, to uh, gather and to, to provide us with, with this information. So what we do is we make efforts to, to share our evaluation and report model with them uh, because uh, I think it's important to help them understand the purpose of the information that we are asking. So we organize sessions with, with theoretical uh, and practical approach uh, to what impact management uh, model is for BBT and for nonprofit organizations uh, because we want to help them to better complete the, the design uh, or the proposals of their projects and also the reporting that they, they have to, to do with them uh, once they develop or they finish. And at the same time, improve their management skills because this, uh, the concept of these sessions is not only 
aimed uh, aimed at uh, providing us with the information that we need, uh, but also for any other project that they they want to undertake. Mm. Great. Well, yeah, that sounds 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 like a really useful sort of initiative there. And I, Henrik, just talking about you, you mentioned earlier. Obviously, you know, you're working with a lot of projects and and programs that you're supporting them as a kind of flexible resource, as and when they need. But it's really their their owning the the whole sort of process. So um, I guess it. We've talked a lot in the community about this sort of balance between trust. And there's actually a whole movement in the UK called trust-based philanthropy, um, which is which is somehow sort of slightly in opposition with this much more kind of technical ap approach which we have on the one side of, of our industry as well, which is gathering more data, like it, isn't it? asking more data, more metrics. So, you know, how, how does that work and how does that work for you at Bertelsmann? Yeah. Um, I think the, the answer in, in, in a nutshell is that you, you sort of have the, to get the balance right. And in particular, you have to avoid uh, coming in, in, in a situation where there is a trade-off between trust um, and accountability. Um, and there is a certain danger there because um, of the motivation of the people that are typically, typically, typically working uh, in nonprofit organizations uh, such as charitable foundations. Um, and that has to do with this uh, uh, value base I talked about earlier. Um, there is uh, uh, sometimes a difference between an, an inside and an outside view uh, to that. The outside view is that in principle, it is of course uh, good to be uh, concentrated on good governance um, and evaluative thinking. Um, the inside view is that it can be perceived uh, as a form of control, as an, uh, a negative intrusion, um, as an imposition, um, and as being untrusting um, in, in the work that, that you do. Um, and that is particularly what you would like to, to uh, avoid. Um, and I think what, what, what you would like to see instead, what we would like to see instead, is... Um, to get to a common understanding that is probably could be described as we're in this together. Uh, we're on this journey together and it's a learning journey. Um, and I think that also makes clear why this is very much a cultural issue. Um, it pays to, to appreciate the fact that you're operating in a nonprofit environment. Um, I probably would also like to touch a little on what this means in practical terms. Mm -hmm. um, I think it means developing a common understanding of the systems complexity uh, you're working it, you're working in. It also means um, defining, have a common understanding of the niche you're operating in. Why is it what you do? Why is that important to society? Why that does make? Why does this particular role uh, make a difference? Um, and it sort of connects to what, what Lee uh, said earlier. Um, I think you need to allow for room, room for uh, evaluative thinking. You have to have formats and procedures for that. Um, and you sometimes forget that in, in everyday project management. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that this is probably what, what we mean as a community. Uh, when we speak about moving from proving to improving. Mm -hmm. um, and there is, I think, a lot of good news also in, in that respect. I hear people talking about, and you mentioned that, uh, trust-based funding, um, unrestricted support, capacity building also goes in, into that direction. And I think it also, so all of that supports this idea of a common learning journey. Mm -hmm. Great. So... Um, yeah, just build, building on, on what, what Henrik just said, Lee, I mean, you've talked about also changing the language when you work with all of your partners away from accountability and uh, towards learning. So just wondering how do you, you know, foster that that learning and, and how do you really make it happen and, you know, live that learning organisation idea? Well, it's still, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a, something that never ends for a start. Uh, you never get to the end of being a learning organization. You're always uh, continually uh, 
working on it and reinventing uh, yourself, hopefully with your partners. Um, the first things first, you know, when I kind of just could, I kind of dig down a little bit into how we use rubrics or the criteria that we've we put uh, for measuring our theory of change, we very much put the partners, first of all, in the driving seat. When we go, uh, when we develop a, a, uh, an initiative together, they're the ones who actually select um, the rubrics that apply to them. So we don't force um, a set of criteria on them. And those criteria are broad enough to actually contain many things. So uh, it's that's that's good for them in terms of um, putting them in the driving seat for uh, their own assessment of progress or their own contribution assessment, which they've got to do. Um, the other thing that we do uh, is, you know, I think, you know, IMM on the evaluation side is necessary, but it isn't uh, sufficient. Evaluation can be a big turnoff, as I think as Henrik has just alluded to. Um, and I always bring it back with our part in conversation with our partners is um, I want us to learn together. And I want us to evaluate together. And that's a much more um, comfortable place to be rather than uh, to say in, in a very traditional term, well, we're the funder and we're going to evaluate you and see um, how well you did. Um, that often is, a, is uh, quite a turn off and it can only, you know, leads to, it actually kind of, in a way, it can, it can feed distrust and can feed uh, a feeling of um, a significant power imbalance, which we're, you know, we're always try conscious of and trying to grapple with when we're trying to get learning going. And that actually, interestingly, is the same inside Laudus uh, to some extent as it is with our partners. So, um, you know, we work quite intensively uh, in effective philanthropy with our programmatic teams um, to build out their learning muscle um, by actually getting learning champions within the program teams, um, having obviously resources and budget behind that as well, and also getting our senior management to lead from the top. So one of the interesting things we just did um, uh, at the end of last year is we had a, a failure festival um, uh, where, where we all had to kind of uh, report on the last year's uh, failures, which is a good way actually to start talking about, okay, what you're learning, because of course you always learn more from failing than you do actually from going from one success to the next. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks so much, Lee. And I just realized, just to cl clarify, because perhaps for some of the Spanish audience, you know, the concept of partners could be confusing. So uh, in the foundation world, I think we're, we're starting to use the, the language of partners a lot more than grantees or investees. But we are talking yeah. about, about organizations ultimately that, you know, you're funding or yeah, of course. funding or Bertelsmann, just, just to clarify yeah. that kind of the terminology element. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a story to why, of course, background to why we, we changed from calling grantees, grantees to partners. We wanted to, again, make a conscious effort to shift some of that power imbalance. Yeah. yeah. And that language matters in, in that yeah, sense. It does. Um, I'd love to open out to, to the audience if there are any um, questions. We've got a really fabulous um, group of people who are very thoughtful about this, this topic. So, um, if anyone has questions, this is a really good time um, to ask them. So I'll just wait to see if, if those emerge. And in the meantime, um, please please post your questions now. We've got, um, you know, we've got 20 minutes or so to be able to answer your questions. So now's the time. Um, so I guess thinking about the audience and the fact that you guys have been, you know, on this journey for some time individually and also obviously within your organizations, there are probably some people here who are starting, starting out who don't have the maybe budgets that some of you guys do, um, you know, what, what would you, what would you say are the most essential things to start doing in this whole kind of realm? Um, and I hand that over to anyone who, who feels like they, they want to answer it. Make it simple. <laughs> that's my, that's my tip, especially at the beginning. Um, I, I, well, I think that it's, uh, 
it's not necessary to have like uh, hundreds uh, of KPIs and to design them and to, to gather like loads of uh, information, but uh, to have a, a few KPIs that really help you to evaluate if, if your, your activities and your projects are achieving their goals or not. And if it is aligned with your strategy and it's responding to what you really want to, 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 to achieve. Uh, and this can also help you to decide which projects need to, to be boosted or which ones need to be reshaped, maybe. Mm -hmm. Once you learn to make decisions uh, based on these results, I think, yeah, you, can, you cannot go back to, to the previous situation. So, okay. Leo, Leo, I yeah, can see you mute. Yeah, I agree with uh, Veronica completely. Yeah, keep it simple. Um, I think it's really important to think about always the context that your philanthropic organisation is situated. And again, going back to the system, if you have systems change ambitions, um, then you need to think about that carefully. And then, uh, secondly, and, and lastly, you need to think about coming out of that. What are the questions that you need to answer? Because, of course, you know, impact management or measurement or, uh, you know, evaluation is driven by um, and should be driven by a good question or a good set of questions. So think about your learning questions uh, for yourselves and for your grantees or partners. Mm -hmm. Okay, Henrik. Um, just, just to add to that, um, and I completely agree with, with both uh, Veronica and, and, and Lee on, on what they've said. Uh, to add to that, um, provide for an outside view. Uh, and that can probably be easier done talking to your peers, um, exactly what we're doing in the community. Um, you can, I think, organize that in your respective country. Uh, just pass the, the borders of your own organization. We're doing that in project uh, work anyways when we work with partners. Um, and we can do that for IMM uh, relatively easily and cheaply. Um, and uh, it doesn't need to um, to be very expensive to do that. Um, mm -hmm. So that would be, would be my advice. Great. Um, so I have a question here um, from someone in the audience, Loek Peters, who's, who asks, what do you see as the biggest gap in the IMM knowledge base today? Who's brave enough to answer that? Are we are we thinking? <laughs> well, 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 one one I think has already been mentioned. Lee um, um, said that get the complexity issue uh, right. Systems thinking. Uh, be as sure as you can, as knowledgeable as you can about the system you're about to enter. You're going to navigate in. Um, and that is sort of continuous work because the, that system is always changing. Um, and uh, another thing that comes to my mind is, and it has to do with what we said earlier about um, um, less is more and, and pick few but, but telling indicators. Um, and what we probably should concentrate more and have to think more about is how do we see early signs of change? Uh, it, it, it doesn't do us any good to uh, see five years later that we've done the, uh, the right or wrong things. Um, and, and how sort of uh, do, do we see the early change and see that things move into the correct direction, the, the correct uh, the direction we would like them to move to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, just to kind of build on what Henrik said in, in one word, I think the, one of the biggest, not a gap, but it's a danger in a way is um, a continued, to some extent, a continued rush towards um, metrics standardization can only result in, if it's done, could only result in, to some extent, in reductionism. And you, you have a danger of ignoring context. Um, mm -hmm. We're not dealing with, we're often not dealing in, with simple uh, contexts. And we need to embrace um, complexity and that means that we need to embrace mixed forms of evidence mm -hmm. you know for me as an anthropologist originally I, you know I'm, I'm naturally uh, uh, biased towards you know deep qualitative 
evidence. I love quantitative evidence as well, and I think they're best when they go together. Mm -hmm. um, and th there is a bit of a, um, a you know a push towards standardized tools, standardized um, metrics, um, which you know there is not a one size fits all. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not so much a gap, but a risk. Mm. Yeah, I guess it's it's there's there is an an understandable desire to sort of create a more comparable set of data, which I think as humans we're sort of interested about. Mm. But yeah, it comes with risks and dangers. Uh, and definitely. you can, I mean, you know, I know the Center for Effective Philanthropy, of course, given that I'm, I'm on their board, they have the, the Grantee Perception Survey. Mm -hmm. which is a lovely standardized tool mm -hmm. um, for looking at getting feedback uh, on certain issues from uh, from grantees periodically. Mm -hmm. um, so there are I think there are there are there is a place and there is a, a great use for standardization and benchmarking, which um, mm -hmm. the field needs. Yeah, but as you say, maybe not around the kind of end outcome metrics or, or things. Yeah, yeah, that's when it gets tricky. That's when it gets, <laughs> yeah. So, so we have uh, Veronica. Was there anything you wanted to add there? No, I, I agree with with uh, Henry and Lee. Uh, I I really think that the standardizing is is one of the biggest uh, challenge for the I mean, may, I, I impact management measure in the future. And maybe I think um, SDG framework could help because I mean it's it's like a common language for both uh, profit and non-profit organizations that we are all starting to to include in our reports and uh, that maybe it could help I don't know to to have like a, that a pool of common KPIs that could uh, help to benchmark mm -hmm. easily. Yeah, and they're being collected anyway on a national level, so that that helps <laughs> in terms of uh, f the, the the resources required. We we have another question from Bonnie Chu, who was one of our lovely external speakers who came to um, share with the community about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in impact management, which is a really important topic. Um, so Bonnie asks, does evaluative culture and thinking include learning from failures? If so, how do you get people, especially boards and grantees, comfortable with sharing failures? Short answer is yes, it does. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I mean, we've all done, most of us have done evaluations or we've been part of evaluation processes. Every evaluation has a bit of, you know, a good amount of success and failure in it uh, normally. Um, and Again, I, you know, I go back to um, the emphasis on learning and accountable learning um, around uh, using evaluation in a, a kind of constructive uh, way. And for our board, um, you know, we've got a strong commitment to transparency. So we publish um, all of our evaluations. Um, some of our partners in the past, of course, we have, they feel reticent at times around publishing. Uh, and a kind of there is a fear of failure, and we all have that as individuals and groups. After all, we should acknowledge that. Um, but learning from evaluation can only uh, get you uh, a couple of things: integrity and trust. I think there's a great value in 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 demonstrating some vulnerability and saying, "Well, we failed, and this is what we're learning from that, and this is how we're going to improve." Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know. Most of our, you know, most of our partners understand that, and I can say, you know, hand on heart, over the last uh, eight years working in uh, CNA Foundation allowed us, our evaluations have not caused any damage to partners or indeed to ourselves mm -hmm. in terms of reputational risk. They only enhance it. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting because there is obviously resistance. I'm sure. Yeah. People are worried that that will affect their future funding opportunities, yeah. and yeah, I can can see that. Uh, I, I'm wondering how many people actually, you know, download and read those impact evaluations you publish, Lee. Is that <laughs> out of interest? Is that something you get you get traffic? We do website? track it. Um, and, you know, some some evaluations get more traction um, uh, than others. And I mean, yeah. we got we got when we evaluated the end of CNA Foundation in 2019, we were evaluating us and we had an external team come in and work with us for nearly a year. When we published it, um, I mean, we got quite uh, good feedback. Quite a lot of uh, of 
people also contacting me and, and getting uh, information on how we did that. I'm brave enough to publish, of course. People are always interested in the transparency conundrum and question. Mm -hmm. um, and we do, and, you know, my communication colleagues are going to track all that data. Um, yeah. yeah, and things do get downloaded, but um, perhaps not as much as we'd always like. Um, mm -hmm. It depends mm -hmm. on the subject. Yeah. Maybe one of the, yeah. So, so, so Henrik and Veronica, how do you see that whole sort of learning from failure? And I guess that touches on the, very much on the transparency question. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd probably uh, like to bring an, an in, add to that with an, with an uh, internal uh, view. Um, I, I think it, it helps if you think of project management as being adaptive to changing uh, situations. Uh, that it is an absolutely normal thing in the type of system change work we do, uh, that the world out there changes and you change your approach. Mm. Um, and th that is, uh, if you think in that term, change is normal um, mm. and you cannot plan for a five years ahead, um, mm. almost mm. never with the kind of work we do, uh, mm. then it becomes normal. Uh, to to sort of adapt and uh, failure is is part of that mm -hmm. um and i think that that is sort of the, the kind of thinking we uh we are looking for mm, yeah that's interesting yeah so change so it's not so much failure as just adapting to change as it were yeah mm. it's a psychotherapy of about of, of learning <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure there's a room for a, a Freud or a Jung or someone to <laughs> take, take over this space. Ver Veronica, how do you see the transparency question and at BBK? No, I, I completely agree with, with what uh, our colleagues said, Lee and Henrik. I think that the work of the directors, they, they are really grateful of knowing uh, uh, which uh, projects or projects or initiatives are are having better results and which others are not resulting as planned? It, it's it's not something I don't see it like a failure, as Henry said, but more uh, it's it's a matter of uh, if you really want to use your resource, that are limited, and uh, to to get more from them, uh, you really need to have this kind of consistent and solid uh, information that that. Uh, helps you to, to improve your decision-making process. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the grantees, well, with, with the grantees, it's a little bit different because uh, when you sometimes, you know, the, the, the projects they design uh, are like a little baby and they don't want to change it normally, but uh, you have to be careful with the way you, you communicate this and you get, get them. Get them feedback but they, um, they, I think that they are also in the end they are they are great, grateful of knowing that uh, the effort that they were making uh, maybe is not uh, achieving the results the expected results and the better way to 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 improve the results is to, to redesign and to rethink that maybe that's not the way the best way to, to get the solution yeah mm -hmm. to solve the problem that they are addressing so uh, at the beginning, it, it could be a little bit like you know disappointing for them, but in the end, they 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 feel like oh, okay, so maybe we we really need to to have this kind of information like uh, um, with a, an objective uh, report and metrics uh, that maybe they were not used to to have before, but once we 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 make them or help them see the results of their, their of their projects they they really uh, evaluate it i think we've lost leonora leonora yes uh okay so i'll, I'll step in <laughs> um i think leonora is frozen um so I, I just wanted to, uh, I think we have five more minutes and there's a question as well from the audience um, and which is, I think is a, a really interesting one um, uh, asking, and I think you might not be the types of funders who would do this, but uh, are there still funders that are consciously choosing metrics 
that result in something nice to communicate, um, you know, rather than thinking about the metrics that you really, um, you know, understand what is going, what is, what goes wrong. You know, this is a question from Nicolas Malmondier. So is anyone brave enough to take on this question? Well, I guess I'll have a first go and then Henrik and Veronica can, can back me up or contradict me. Um, to me, it's not so much funders consciously choosing metrics. It, again, I go back to the kind of overall transparency issue. When I, when I go and look at other foundations, I, the first thing I do is I visit the website. And, I, and being an evaluator, I go straight to look for evaluations and, and for uh, evidence on results. And um, I think foundations in general, European and US based ones are getting much better on publishing uh, their results and also publishing, of course, success and failure and why and, and how they got that um, uh, along with partners. Um, but, you know, the, the, I think, you know, kind of eluding their consciously choosing, you know, metrics to result in nice things to communicate it would, to me, imply impact washing, um, which um, I think it's difficult to uh, difficult sometimes to actually see that in the sector. And I'm, I'm more worried if I just can't see anything um, from uh, foundations. And I've had lots of conversations over the last eight years with other foundations, some of which are um, quite closed and others are on their journey towards um, transparency. And after all, you know, if we want to learn together and learn uh, ourselves, we need to be sharing, uh, sharing uh, data and sharing those stories of impact. Yeah, and, and perhaps the, the the comment that Henrik made before about external verification, oh, it's it's it is uh, useful to have you know sometimes someone external to come and and, and have a look and give you some feedback. You know, you yeah. might not even realize you know that that you're putting those metrics that are sort of easy to achieve, um, and and it might not be because you want to look good because um, you might not have the same type of pressure um, in the foundation sector as you know in for example, in impact investing. Um, but but yeah, I think the external opinion and viewpoint is is important to 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 have as a sounding board once in a while at least. Yeah. I don't know if Veronica or Henrik would like to uh, add if something. I, if I may, yes, I, I I agree completely, Lisa. It's not so much that you consciously, I think, consciously try to find nice looking metrics, but rather. Um, that you are sort of married to to your project um, in an operating foundation like 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 our, ours, people take it to their heart. Um, that is part of their motivation. Uh, but then it is very difficult to sort of be critical to uh, to your pet project. It goes for more board members as well, by the way. Um, and uh, that's where this outside view comes in. Um, and you sort of have to uh, allow for that. Uh, get, have to allow for that that critical uh, view, that outside view, uh, that makes you leave that that well, taking things too too close to your heart and 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 sort of insulating yourself against uh, um, adverse messages. Um, so so it's it's not so much as choosing metrics consciously. Uh, but allowing for for formats and procedures that protect you from that. Um, I just want to apologize very much. I had an unexpected um, shutdown of my computer there. I can see we're still on the psychotherapy of evaluative thinking now, isn't it? So, okay, <laughs> but, uh, so uh, not much has changed. It's marriage marriage um, counseling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, pets and marriage and, uh, yeah, ex ex external perspectives. So, yeah. Um, I think we've we've got some more questions, but we probably need to wrap up now because we're we're hitting the time. So, um, well, thank you so much to our panelists and Lisa. I'll hand over to you to to wrap everything up. Thank you so much, Noah, and, and I'd I'd like to as well extend my my thanks to our uh, amazing panelists. I think it's been really valuable for the audience to hear your insights uh, and really to understand 
you know, how you are tackling these questions in your uh, respective foundations. Uh, also, thank you to Leonora for uh, doing a wonderful job at moderating. Um, and of course, uh, to all of the, the, the foundations who have participated in these communities of practice, because um, I think it's been uh, a wonderful learning experience for all of us, you know, including the Asada team. Uh, and uh, as well, you know, uh, thanks to BBK for supporting us throughout this journey. Um, and, and of course, the audience, you know, who has participated today and, and anyone who's going to listen uh, to this webinar afterwards as well. Um, and on a few practical uh, things, you know, we have a newsletter at the ISADA Center for Social Impact that I encourage you to sign up uh, for because we have lots of interesting information that uh, comes through the newsletter. Uh, the publication itself, um, the report will be available uh, next week and we'll be sending that to uh, everyone who's, who's um, sort of signed up for the uh, webinar and we'll also make it available on our website. Uh, so we really encourage you to dig into this publication and of course as well give us feedback and, and you know, questions that you might have. Um, so I, I also wanted to kind of come back to the purpose of, of all of this work. And I think that, um, you know, it, it has been illustrated really well, you know, through the panel and the, the uh, publication or the presentation of the report that, of course, you know, we are interested in understanding how to measure and manage impact better. And here the underlying assumption is that, you know, by doing that we will also have a greater impact, you know, so we're all sort of interested in uh, improving, you know, the way that we work so that we can help uh, more people, um, you know, through through our different activities. So that's really how I'd like to uh, finish this this webinar and uh, thank everyone for joining um, and have a wonderful day. And uh, please get in touch with us if you have any questions. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.